average American is eating for 16 hours a day. And 60% of the food we eat is processed. Uh, probably about three months ago, I started getting really itchy. And then just like in like my chest would itch like crazy, my back would itch like crazy. I'm like, what is going on? Because I'm really religious on my diet. I don't cheat on my diet, but a couple times a year, like I'm really hardcore about it. And then it, it started with like a little spot on my neck. And then it was like, I had to wear like long sleeve, everything. I was just one big rash. It was, it was insane. And I've never had anything like that in my life. And so I was like, this, I know this is something I'm eating. Just like in my gut, I can feel that that's true but I haven't changed my diet. So I was like, what could this be? And before I give you the punchline of what I think it is, what, when you hear stuff like that, where do you go? Well, you're, the best way to think about your skin is your, the lining of your gut is actually your skin turned inside out. That's fascinating. And so you have from your mouth all the way down to your anus, a tube that's got the surface area of a tennis court. And everything that you swallow is actually outside of you as it's moving through. The inside skin has to do the same functions as the outside skin, and that is kind of keep things away from us, but it's got a fatal flaw. It not only has to keep things out, but it has to let things in, mm. like the proteins and the fats and the sugars that we eat. So that's where the mischief can happen. But when I see someone with an external skin problem, it's always a reflection of what's actually happening in the gut. What is that process? What does it look like? How can people that are watching this now, if they're struggling from something, how do they begin that process of repair? So, the, you know, I think the first thing you do is get major lectin containing foods out of your diet. You won't like me for a couple of weeks, uh, but most people, even within a couple of weeks, begin to notice a difference. Now, what are those? They're foods that we actually, evolutionary, were not designed to eat. Beans are so lethal, raw, that there's very good published studies in humans that they can cause massive bloody diarrhea. And there's some pretty good studies in monkeys, rhesus monkeys and red velvet monkeys, monkeys that they can actually cause heart disease and even kidney damage from the lectin content. Mm. What's fascinating from a human evolution standpoint is that humans up until the dawn of agriculture were actually very tall creatures. Uh, most humans were about six feet tall and our brain size was about 15 percent bigger than it is today. And when if you look chronologically by 8,000 years uh, 2,000 years into grain and bean eating, we actually shrunk about a foot. And our brain wow. size has never recovered from 10,000 years ago. Mm. So these are anti-nutrients. Grains and beans, that's number one. Number two, 2,000 years ago, northern European cows suffered a genetic mutation spontaneous mutation where they stopped making the normal protein in milk casein A2 and began making casein A1. Now casein A1 has a lectin-like protein that is converted into a compound called beta caseomorphine which can cause a direct immunologic attack on the beta cell of the pancreas, the insulin producing cell in the pancreas. And there's some pretty good evidence, and it's accumulating every, every year, that one of the causes of type 1 diabetes or juvenile diabetes is casein A1 milk. And it actually correlates very well in countries that have casein A1 cows. They have much higher incidence of type 1 diabetes than countries that have casein A2 cows. Cheeses, for instance, are safe from France, Italy, and Switzerland. Sheep, goats, and water buffalo are all casein A2. And what is it about that that's so problematic? It actually makes a, it's a lectin-like compound that stimulates an immune response. So just as I would get from the beans or whatever, I'm exactly. getting Exactly, you'll get the same thing. Okay. So it's a, it's a very new addition to our diet. Now, the newest addition to our diet is some of our most precious foods are American North American or South American foods. For instance, in the nightshade family, uh, potatoes, eggplant, peppers, 
tomatoes, and goji berries. So the, the nightshades, the peel and the, and the seeds have the lectins. And Native American Indians in the Southwest always peel and de-seed their peppers. They char their peppers, they de-seed them, and then they either grind it into chili or eat them that way. But they always do that. The Italians always peel and de-seed their tomatoes before they make sauce. And is this like a cultural intuition kind of thing where they... Yeah. What I, what I like to do is I go around the world studying cultures and figuring out why did they do this? How mm. did they detoxify lectins? For instance, rice was invented 8,000 years ago. Four billion people uh, use rice as their staple. Yet four billion people take the hull off of rice and eat it white. And surely there can't be four billion dumb people who don't know any better that white rice is bad for them and brown rice is good for them. Mm -hmm. In fact, they've been taking the hull off of rice for 8,000 years. Same way, believe it or not, up until William, William and Harvey Kellogg in the early 1900s did the idea that whole grains were good for us. And if you look back 50 years, and when the whole grain goodness really caught on, you'll notice that a lot of our current health issues, including this epidemic of autoimmune disease, didn't occur. This epidemic of dementia didn't occur. And so whole grains are one of those wonderful myths that got perpetrated by a few individuals. The other individual that perpetrated this, English surgeon by the name of Dr. Burkett. And Dr. Burkett uh, did some missionary work in Africa in the middle of the, cent of the last century. And he is a colon surgeon, a guy who would operate on colon cancers. And he went down there to do some work and nobody had colon cancer. And he actually went around and watched and looked at the bowel movements of these Africans who were eating huge amounts of tubers, things like yams, for instance, mm. or celerac root, or jicama. And their bowel movements were huge. And he goes, wow, you know, look at all, they're eating all this fibrous stuff. And it must be that the fiber in their diet is keeping them from having colon cancer. So he came back to England and he espoused the, the fiber theory of preventing cancer. Now the problem is in England, they didn't have a lot of these sorts of tuberous foods but they had tons of what's called insoluble fiber in the form of wheat and rye and barley and even oats. So he didn't know the difference between insoluble fiber and soluble fiber. Mm. And so he said, we should all be eating fiber. And so that's actually where that whole idea that the hall was actually good for you. Now the ironic thing is he actually died of colon cancer. That is very ironic. Very ironic. Uh, there's a saying among surgeons that we always die from the disease we treat, so. <laughs> well then, so that, oh, there's so many interesting points in there. Talk to me about how animal meats end up, because you don't eat hardly any. Um, how, how does lectin find its way into animal meat? We raise animals with antibiotics, and this was discovered by by accident years ago when they were thinking that antibiotics might be needed for crowded conditions of um, you know, stockyard animals. But the researcher found out that by giving antibiotics to these animals, they grew faster and got fatter much quicker than the animals who didn't get the antibiotics. Mm -hmm. So it was approved uh, by the Department of Agriculture and the FDA to give antibiotics to animals for the purpose of growth. Those, what we didn't know is that those residual antibiotics are incorporated into the meat, mm -hmm. of the beef, the chicken, the pork, you name it. And so we actually, every time we ingest factory raised meats or even farm raised fish, ingest micro doses of antibiotics. Microdoses of antibiotics are incredibly effective at killing off your microbiome. Mm -hmm. So, in the last 40 years, we've had this, you know, 
incredible, you know, the, the, the worst storm that could possibly happen for our microbiome and for our leaky gut. So then are lectins, there are lectin-like substances in the meat, but is there actually lectin itself? Great question. There was just a paper published from Ohio State a few weeks ago that shows that lectins in soybeans can be found in the meat of animals that you feed them to. Now, I used to think that this was kind of fanciful in the alternative medicine world. You know, you are what you eat, but you are what the thing you're eating ate. And as I started seeing more and more autoimmune patients, uh, we had case reports of, uh, particularly there's a woman psychologist in L.A. that I talk about in the book who had horrible lupus, was on two drugs, and we got her off of all her drugs by following this program. And her, her lupus cleared, uh, she had rashes. And um, she, she came back to see me and she said, you know, everything's great, but I've got this eczema, this little rash on my upper eyelids. And so we're going through the list. I said, well, something's getting into you. Mm. And we get to pasture-raised chicken. And I said, now you're, you're eating pasture-raised chicken. She said, oh yeah, I eat organic free-range chicken all the time. It's my go-to food. I said, Free range chicken? And she said, yeah, yeah, you know, organic free range. I said, well, the federal government in 2007 passed a law that says you can keep 100,000 chickens in a warehouse, feed them organic corn and soybeans, and not let them out of the warehouse except open a door for five minutes every 24 hours, and the chicken has the potential to go outside. And that is the current government definition of organic free range chicken. Wow. So she was eating the lectins of soybeans and corn mm. in the chicken that she was eating. I trained in London, England uh, for children's heart surgery and my kids were four and six years old and they missed Kentucky Fried Chicken terribly. And a Kentucky Fried Chicken opened in London. Now in those days, there was so much fish available in England that the chickens were fed ground up fish meal. Whoa. And the, the chicken breasts were actually translucent, like fish. And uh, so, you know, we go to Kentucky Fried Chicken, they both grab a drumstick and they bite into the drumstick. And my four-year-old goes, oh, oh, you tricked us. This is fish. Oh, this isn't chicken. Whoa. And I'm going, oh, no, 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 no. Look, you know, drumstick, you know, Colonel right. Sanders, that's chicken. No, oh, it's fish. Well, she was right. It wasn't a chicken. It was a chicken with feathers that was actually a fish. So we have to realize that our chickens are no longer chickens. They're an ear of corn with feathers. Americans are 70% carbon atoms from corn, Whoa. a substance that we were never exposed to until 500 years ago. Europeans are 5% corn. In fact, France in, in 1900 banned corn as unfit for human consumption. Wow. So yeah. what I want people to do is, is eat and party like it's 9,999 years ago before we started all this mess. Mm. And when we do that with people and teach them how to do it, it's amazing what happens to them. Well, let's talk about that because if I had um, only heard some headlines about you, I would have thought, oh, red meat, I'll get after it because I eat a ton of red meat and think I'm doing healthy things. So you don't eat a lot of meat, why not? So we found that there was a, a molecule, a sugar molecule on the wall of pig blood vessels that's totally different from the sugar molecule that's in ours. But it differs by only one actually atom, and it's, new, it's called NU5GC uh, in pigs, cows, and lambs, and we carry what's called NU5AC, and I have nothing against red meat, but if you look statistically, the red meat eaters do have significantly more coronary artery disease and significantly more cancer. Now, why cancer? Well, it turns out that cancer tumors in humans use new 5 gc to shield themselves from detection by the immune system. Mm. 
The problem is we don't manufacture new 5GC, nor can a cancer cell, which means they acquired it from external sources, namely beef, lamb, and pork. Now, fish doesn't carry it. They have the same molecule that we do, and chicken have the same molecule that we do. So I urge people, uh, if they're going to eat animal protein, and I, I do, uh, to use wild shellfish or wild fish as their main source of animal protein. Do I eat meat? Yeah, I mean, do I eat beef? I do. Uh, but I get grass-fed and grass-finished beef, and I use it as, as a treat, not as a mainstay of my diet. Mm. And then what's your take on eggs? The yolk of the egg may be the most beneficial food that has ever been invented. And as long as the chickens are fed what they're designed to eat. Well, I actually ask people to mainly throw the whites away. Uh, so we'll do a, a four egg omelet, but four of them are yolks and just use one white. And what is it in the whites or about the whites that make them problematic? It's, okay, it's animal protein. And let's look at another reason not to eat animal protein, sadly. So animal protein, there, we, there's a sensor in all of our cells called mTOR, and it senses energy availability, and it senses sugar availability, but it senses certain amino acid availability. So if you avoid or lessen your amount of animal protein, your mTOR will fall. Now, we have no way of measuring clinically mTOR, but we can use a surrogate for that which is insulin-like growth factor, IGF-1. And in my super old people, and I study a lot of super olds, 95 and above, wow. um, they all have extremely low insulin-like growth factors. And why, why is that a number you wanna get down? Because super old people always run low insulin-like growth factors, they always do. And uh, in my upcoming book, The Longevity Paradox, if you look at societies of the blue zones, the longest living people on earth, the common factor that they all have in their diet, they have very diverse diets. Uh, there's no universal diet that these people follow. Mm. And I was a professor at one of the blue zones, Loma Linda, for most of my life. The thing that separates or, or unites all of those various diets is they eat very little animal protein. And one of the things we notice about super old people is they run low body temperatures. They're running 96 degrees, whereas you and I are run, running 98.6. Mm. And they become incredibly efficient creatures. My mentor, uh, Dr. Morrow, always said that you only have so many heartbeats. And when you use those up, uh, that's the end. And he's actually right in a lot of ways, uh, but the corollary to that is, let's suppose your design is that you only get so many calories in your lifetime, and you can use them quickly, or you can spread them out. And that's why, that's why fasting uh, is so useful, and intermittent fasting is so useful, because it's actually an easy way just to reduce your calorie intake. And it's, you know, once you learn how to do it, it's, it's an easy way to make the system work. How do you pull it off? So I'm a huge proponent of intermittent fasting and fasting in general. Um, how do you do it? How do you make it an easy process? So I started uh, 11 years ago, uh, at January 1st to June 1st. Uh, during the week, I would eat all my calories in a two-hour window from 6 to 8 o'clock at night. So that 22 out of the 24 hours every day, five days a week, I was fasting 22 hours. Now, why 6 to 8 o'clock at night? Because that's when my wife and I were at home. And, <laughs> um, now, this is, as you know, uh, for a professional driver on a closed course. Right. What most people who try to do this don't realize, uh, about 80% of us in America are insulin resistant. We have much too much insulin production. Mm -hmm. And I won't bore you or the listeners, but most people 
can't do prolonged fasting for even more than a few hours because they can't access the fat that they store. Right. And they crash. And it's often called the Adkins flu or the low carb flu, where they have to be able to transition over to using ketones as a fuel. Mm. Now you can get there fairly quickly and we have tips in the book on how to do that. You actually have to use exogenous ketones for a while, things like MCT oil, things like coconut oil, even red palm oil. There's a little bit of exogenous ketones in butter. It's called butyric acid. Yeah, it's um, intermittent fasting is really, really powerful for alleviating brain fog, for changing your relationship to hunger is how I always think of it. It's just fundamentally different. And then getting your machinery used to actually accessing your body fat and all that. We're designed to use up fat. We just have to you know, use the tricks to get to that fat. For most people who are overweight or obese, what's so frustrating for them is they try things like intermittent fasting and they're pretty miserable, they get headaches and they're, they're very hungry, their brain is going, hey, you know what, what's the deal, you've cut me off. Mm -hmm. It's water, water everywhere and not a drop to, to drink. And we see so many overweight and obese people, and I was 70 pounds overweight, I was obese running 30 miles a week and going to the gym one hour a day wow. and going, Why? how come I'm such a fat guy? I couldn't get to my fat stores because I had an elevated insulin level. Mm. When I first you know, got my insulin level, I was, whoa, um, what's that? Now I have a very low insulin level. Mm. No, that stuff is fascinating in terms of the complexities of really breaking through and figuring out for you, what do you have to do to lose fat, keep it off? and. Yeah, it's a, a very complex thing. And to that end, not necessarily, my question is not really about fat loss, but um, given what we've been talking about, lectins and autoimmune and all of those joints, aches, pains, all the things that come along with it, uh, psoriasis, all of that, what should people be eating? So we, we've got a rough sense of what we should be avoiding, but what should we be actively pursuing? Okay, so uh, the only purpose of food is to get olive oil into your mouth. Um, <laughs> There are three long-lived societies in the blue zones that use a liter of olive oil per week. That's, That's about 12 to 14 tablespoons a day. Can I use it to saute? You can use it to saute. Believe it or not, there's a wonderful paper from the NIH showing that olive oil does not break down into harm harmful compounds. That's amazing. But bring olive oil to the table. So if you're going to have a steak, please pour it on your meat, mm -hmm. as they do in Italy. They always bring a bottle of olive oil so you can have steak Florentina and just drench it with olive oil. The steak is there to get olive oil into your mouth. Mm -hmm. Broccoli is there to get olive oil into your mouth. Um, a salad is there to get olive oil into your mouth. So there are wonderful cruciferous vegetables. You can have all the bok choy, broccoli, cauliflower, have cauliflower pizzas. There's a great recipe in my cookbook for cauliflower pizza. Uh, Can I have Japanese sweet potatoes? Yes, please. Oh, they're so good. Yeah, but the purpose of the sweet potato is to get olive oil into your mouth. Yes, which works for me just fine if I can saute or use an air fryer. Yeah. You have can, you done yes, the indeed. air fryers? Oh my God, they're like french fries. They sure are. So, yeah, so those out. are great for you. Things like yucca or yucca uh, make phenomenal french fries, but parboil them first and then put them in the air fryer. Also, any tuber, so like celerac root is fantastic, jicama. So get some guacamole. Believe it or not, true guacamole does not have tomatoes in it. Mm -hmm. That's an American whatever. Yeah. And get yourself some jicama sticks. Trader Joe's has them. Lots of plain old grocery stores have them. Use that as your dipping chip. Other thing I like people to get is uh, vegetables in the chicory family. Uh, the more chicory you can get in your life, radicchio, the kind of Italian red lettuce, is pure inulin and your gut bugs will love, for, love it for it. Hello, my friend. You know that I believe success requires you to see failure as the ultimate learning tool. Success requires you to be disciplined and gritty and to never ever quit on your dreams. I say all of that because one thing is certain, the road to achieving your goal is not smooth or linear. I wish it was, but it's not. It's gonna be bumpy, sometimes scary. Some days you'll take two steps forward and slide 10 steps back. And that's why success also requires you to know how to pull yourself out of a rut and get unstuck fast. Life is short. 
You can't be messing around with your goals. You've got to make progress every single day. So I've pulled a class from Impact Theory University called How to Get Unstuck, which you can watch for free with the link on your screen or by clicking below. When you join me for that free preview of that workshop from Impact Theory University, I'm going to teach you my strategy for how to understand exactly where you need to be going, how to identify the obstacle that's blocking you, and the best way to make the most progress towards that goal and keep your momentum. All right, click that link and let's get to work. All right, I'll see you on the inside. So now let's walk people through step by step because we haven't even gotten to mitochondria in detail yet, which we'll get there in a minute. It's such an important part of this story. But so first I want to um, begin to help people to understand what it is that breaks the junction in their gut, because that's such a huge part of this. Uh, what is it that triggers the breakdown? Let's start with that. Well, so there's you know, there's three kind of major components. So first of all, and we don't need to talk about this extensively, but lectins are plant. Read the plant paradox. You yeah, go read all into that. They're plant proteins that were designed by plants to protect themselves and their seeds, their babies, from being eaten by making their predator ill to pay attention. Number two, particularly if we're eating a typical American diet with lots of saturated fats, lots of fats in general, and lots of sugars, we in our gut have classes of bacteria, and we have 10,000 different bacteria. And I divide them into gut buddies, good bacteria, and gang members. Gang members love saturated fats and simple sugars. And the problem with these gang mem members is that they divide and die. And pieces of these bacteria called LPSs, lipopolysaccharides, and in all my books, I call them little pieces of shit because that's literally what they are. These guys actually hop on fat molecules and ride through our gut, even without a leaky gut. And when they get to the other side, the immune system cannot tell the difference between a living bacteria and a bacterial cell wall. It's so impressive that, for instance, we could take you or me and inject these LPSs into our bloodstream. And both of us would go into septic shock as if living bacteria had been put into us. So Believe it or not, in the American diet, 24 hours a day, we're causing leaky gut, we're assaulting our immune system with these LPSs. And it's no wonder that just from that, we all you know, are just a giant ball of inflammation. Okay, so um, for my own sake, it'll be interesting to tease out some of the ideas around fat. But first, I want to um, stay on this point just for a second of how people end up getting in a state where they're prone to having that junction break. So I'm going to make some assertions. You tell me or assertions. You tell me if these are correct assertions or not. Um, so one that. Part of the problem is a breakdown in the actual microbiome, so the integrity of a well-balanced microbiome. So you've probably done something to assault that microbiome for a long time. It could be a very non-diverse diet, so some of the bugs are just dying out and so because they're starved to death. Correct. And so you get you know some dysbiosis there. You've got people just shoveling sugar in their face that comes in a gazillion different forms that causes all kinds of havoc, not only in the microbiome, but elsewhere. And, you know, we'll get into some of the other ramifications, I'm sure, later. Um, antibiotics, which are causing that. Glyphosate, which is causing that. So it's like there are so many things that are assaulting our guts. And the reason I'm, I'm prefacing all of this is because one thing that I've had tremendous success with in my life is high fat, low carb. So I'm curious to see like it in my N of one experience, fat of certain kinds anyway, do not seem to be problematic. N of one, I'm well aware of that. So, you know, everybody freaking out that that is not empirical data, I understand. Um, but, you know, there's also obviously a, a pretty interesting carnivore movement. Um, 
So is it certain types of fat? Is it only fat when you've compromised your microbiome or is it, no, 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 fat is in and of itself an assault upon even a healthy microbiome? So I'm, I'm the guy who's famous for saying the only purpose of food is to get olive oil in your mouth. So I'm absolutely not anti-fat. And in all my books, I have a ketogenic plant paradox chapter of exactly that. But having said that, interestingly enough, uh, most fats, even including olive oil, are transported across the wall of our gut using these carriers called chylomicrons. And it's the chylomicrons that these LPSs hop onto. So interesting. Are the chylomicrons a metabolite of some kind? No, chylomicrons are the a uh, moving van that literally carries fat across your gut wall. Fat transverses your gut wall in a totally different way than sugars or proteins. The exception to that is medium chain triglycerides. Now, medium chain triglycerides, MCT oil, are a saturated fat, but they are a unique saturated fat in that they're water soluble. So they transverse the gut wall without chylomicrons, number one, and they don't enter our lymphatic system where chylomicrons go. They go directly from our gut through our portal vein into our liver. And in the liver, MCTs actually tell the liver to make ketone bodies. So whenever you eat, MCT oil or eat MCTs in other forms, you will automatically, do not stop, do not pass go, do not collect $200, you will automatically make ketones in your liver and they'll be released. So help me understand the difference then. So if, if not all fats are bad, what are the fats that are bad that are causing this problem? I didn't, I didn't get that. So, sadly, a lot of the saturated animal fats are some of the biggest mischief makers. But the other Specifically fats, because they're feeding the wrong bacteria. They're feeding the wrong bacteria. And if you don't have these gram-negative bacteria in your gut in huge amounts, you will not produce... LPSs, lipopolysaccharides. So you could have a very high fat diet as long as you don't have these gang members in your, in your life. And those gang members got there, quite frankly, by eating a lot of sugar. So help me then understand. So um, there, you said there is a time for a carnivore diet. I'm guessing there's a, per, a pretty narrow band where you would recommend that, but what would that narrow band be? So we, we will use it uh, for an elimination diet where we've got someone who is really intolerant to plant lectins in general. And we do see these people. Uh, they're totally intolerant to raw plants. Most of the time, um, the lectins in plants can be cooked away. There are exceptions beans, you cannot cook the lectins away. Uh, wheat, you cannot cook lectins away. You can't pressure cook wheat to get rid of the lectins. Oats have a uh, molecule that mimics gluten. Corn has virtually identical molecules to a gluten. In fact, 70% of people who are sensitive to gluten react to corn as if it was wheat. And so many patients, yeah. You know, so many patients that I see on a gluten-free diet for celiac disease, for extreme leaky gut, they're eating corn because it's gluten-free. And when we take corn away from them, so many of them resolve the problem. And you know, it's like, oh my gosh, you know, I've been eating corn chips and corn muffins and corn bread, and I thought that was, you know, gluten-free. Well, it is, but mm. it cross-reacts. So. If you, if you combine a carnivore diet with what I recommend in the book, which is time-restricted eating or compressing your eating window, you can, I want to say, get away with a carnivore diet for a period of time. Um, 
there's a, a very famous young lady who follows a carnivore diet who really wants to get off the carnivore diet, uh, but she can't. Um, and I think we've seen this. And if uh, we were going to really simplify why she can't, I'm guessing it's it is simply a question of the microbiome, right? Like if we could uh, repopulate her microbiome, whether through fecal microbial transplant or magic, whatever, but if we could repopulate her gut, then theoretically she would be able to get off it. The only reason that people get trapped in something like that is because of the changes in their microbiome. Yes. Um, one of the things that I, um, I think is critically important for our health in so many ways that I talk about in the energy paradox is we now know that the, the microbiome, number one, has to be diverse. We know that the Western diet produces the worst kind of non-diverse microbiome that you could possibly, you know, wish for, and you don't wish for that. That's number one. Number two, if you don't give the microbiome plant fibers, which are prebiotic fibers. These are soluble fibers that we can't digest, but the microbiome eats. The microbiome can't produce what are called postbiotics. And I spend a lot of time in the book talking about this exciting discovery of postbiotics. Yeah. Help me understand what the difference between a postbiotic and a metabolite is. Okay, so literally when bacteria ferment uh, fibers, then they, the fermentation process produces both short-chain fatty acids like butyrate, like acetate, like propionate, and they produce a series of gases, hydrogen gas, hydrogen sulfide gas, the rotten egg smell, methane, carbon dioxide, nitric oxide. We used to think that these were just farts that everybody made and they didn't do anything. But uh, about 10 years ago, uh, I usually present a talk at the uh, uh, World Congress of Microbiota, which, is, which happens in Paris <laughs> before COVID. And the organizer is a professor from Paris, uh, Dr. Marvin Edes. He pu pulled me aside about eight years ago and he says, you know, the microbiome talks to mitochondria. And I'm going, oh, that's interesting. How do you know that? He says, well, it has to, because mitochondria, the little energy producing organelles in all of our cells are actually engulfed bacteria. And the bacteria of the microbiome talk to their sisters and they control what happens to the mitochondria. They either tell them to produce energy or things are bad in the engine room, cut back on energy production. I'm going, well, this is fascinating, but why hasn't anybody discovered this? He said, you watch, uh, we will. And sure enough, he was right. So we now know that these, they're now called postbiotics. The gases are called gasomessengers or gasotransmitters. And the short chain fatty acids, we now know, nourish the gut wall, number one, and also nourish brain cells, number two. So the discovery of this language, and it's literally called a trans-kingdom language, where a set of bacteria talk to us, in particular our mitochondria, and it won the Nobel Prize for medicine a few years ago with the discovery. Is of it specifically the gas or is it the gas and the postbiotic? So the gas is a postbiotic. So okay. the, are the short, the short chain fatty acids considered a postbiotic? Post Correct. Okay. Yeah. They're, they're all classified. And what do they do? Is it, is, uh, hey, nitric oxide has arrived, therefore do this. And the flip side, nitric oxide has not arrived and therefore do that? Correct. So for instance, we know that hydrogen sulfide, the rotten egg smell, if you produce the right amount of hydrogen sulfide, you will not produce atherosclerotic disease, plaque in coronary arteries, despite a monstrously high level of cholesterol in the diet. But if you don't produce the right amount of hydrogen sulfide, 
it's as if, you know, let the hell loose from L- LDL. Hold on, hold on. Oh, yeah, that yeah, sounds yeah. like a life-changing uh, <laughs> revelation. I've never heard that before. So I can have freakishly high uh, cholesterol, but if I get the right signal from the my microbiome Correct. in the form of gas, then my body's like, we're good. We're not going to form the, the, the plaque. atherosclerotic plaque. That is like the hardest word in the English language. I know. Yeah. Uh, that's crazy. Why are people not talking about that? Because there's no money in it. You know, as statin drugs are, make a lot of money. Um, you know, and this is, you know, when I look back at the man who changed my life 25 years ago, Big Ed, and watched him clean out the, you know, inoperable plaque in his coronary arteries. By... Did you see him under the knife or was he uh, not surgical? So, yeah, interesting enough, he had so much plaque in all his blood vessels, you couldn't put stents in them. You couldn't do bypasses because there wasn't any place to land. And like so many people, he would go around the country looking for idiots like me to operate on him, to take him on. That's kind of what I did. And he spent six months going to major centers, and I've named them before. um, And everybody turned him down, said, yep, go away, nothing we can do for you. Well, during the six months, he went on a diet and he started taking a bunch of supplements from a health food store and he lost 45 pounds in six months. Now, he was still a big guy. I call him Big Ed because he was 265 when I met him. So he arrives in my office carrying his angiogram, the cardiac catheterization, from six months previous. And I look at it and I go, you know, everybody's right. Nothing we can do for you. You know, sorry. And he says, wait a minute, you know, look, I've been on a diet, I'm taking all these supplements, maybe I did something. And I said, well, you know, good for you for losing weight, but that's not going to do anything in here. And he says, look, what do we got to lose? Let's do another angiogram. And I said, okay. So in six and months that's time. putting a camera in his veins. It, it, yeah, it's doing, putting dye in his veins and taking a 3D picture of where the blockages are. And in six months time, of the blockages are now gone. Now he's still got blockages, but now there's open spaces where I could land a bypass. So if I knew what I knew now, I'd say, great job. See you in six months. It'll probably be all cleaned out. But I didn't know that. So I said, great, you know, we're going to do an operation on you. And we did a five vessel bypass and I'm pretty smart. And then I said, "Um, tell me about this diet and let me look at those supplements. And son of a gun, this guy had actually put himself on a diet that was my thesis as an undergraduate at Yale on what turned a great ape into a human being. And I was so shocked that, you know, this guy did this that I put myself on my thesis and I lost 70 pounds. I was a big fat art surgeon even though I was running 30 miles a week and going to the gym one hour a day. So that's a long way of saying that he actually was the guy who opened my eyes that we've got this all wrong. Yeah, it's it's bananas, man. Every time I talk to you, I mean, forget your book, which is already just chock full of enlightening things, but that that's really crazy. So you say in the book, you make a prediction that in the future, we're going to realize uh, a couple things. One, you say that you refer to the gut as the first brain and not the second brain. But the other thing is this gut gas brain axis. And I've never heard anybody talk about it before. And just to, to re-anchor everybody, we're, we're talking about energy and your body's ability to generate energy. And you've got your gut, which is far more complicated than anybody could possibly realize It's communicating to the organs inside your cell or the organelles inside your cells that generate the actual energy that are themselves bacteria that have their own DNA, which is fascinating unto itself. And all of this then is also having an effect. I won't just say communicating because I think it's more than that. Having an effect on the brain, which is then having massive effects, whether it's fatigue, whether it's the the fogginess, which was the worst part of what I went through. So you just blew my mind with the whole gas communication thing and how it can even play out with plaque. 
now mitochondria. We have to talk about the the idea of um, the the traffic jam that ends up happening. I think it's really important for people. You've already mentioned time restricted, but now talk to me in in the context of that traffic jam because this to me was a big player in why you feel lethargic if you feel like you're lacking energy. Yeah, so mitochondria produce energy from either glucose, which comes from the carbohydrates we eat, or amino acids, proteins that we eat, or from free fatty acids, fats that we eat or that we have stored that we produce. And normally, mitochondria use one of those substances at a time. And quite frankly, if we actually ate whole foods, like I talk in the book, like our great grandparents did, normally carbohydrates, sugar molecules would arrive first for processing. And mitochondria are really good at using one thing at a time. Then after the carbohydrates are gone, protein takes a long time to digest into amino acids and they arrive second. Fat literally takes a circuitous route. It's not even absorbed into our bloodstream. It's absorbed into our lymph system and then comes around later. But what's happened with our processed foods and our ultra processed foods is that we have had made perfect pre-digested sugar, amino acids, and small fat molecules that literally instantaneously enter our bloodstream and wham into our mitochondria simultaneously. And it's literally, uh, since both of us live in the LA area, it is like rush hour traffic in LA with all of these streets leading into our freeways and nothing moves. And what we're doing now The average American work by Sachin Panda at the Salk Institute in San Diego to show that the average American is eating for 16 hours a day. And 60% of the food we eat is processed. So we're just constant in rush hour. It's like the 405, 24 hours a day, as you and I know. And nothing moves. So if we look at energy production, as literally cars moving down through a freeway, it's no wonder that even though we're eating huge amounts of calories, we have no energy because we literally log jam the mitochondria. And just as a fun fun side note, the first pre-digested food that was actually advertised as a benefit was Kellogg's Corn Flakes. It was actually advertised as the first pre-digested food. And why anybody would want to have their food pre-digested, like most of Mm. our food is now, you can thank Kellogg's for doing that over 100 years ago. All right, my friend, I have a big announcement. My incredible and talented wife, Lisa, is about to launch her new book, Radical Confidence. In it, she has managed to perfectly capture the process of how to go from feeling lost and insecure to taking control of your life and doing amazing things despite feeling fear, sometimes a lot of fear. Now, let me tell you, nobody knows Lisa better than me, but when I read Radical Confidence for the first time and heard her describe what it was like for her to go from having these big, Big, exciting dreams as a kid to then as an adult scheduling her life around the TV shows that she wanted to watch or how lonely and isolated she felt instead of pursuing her dreams, it was brutal for me. I would never say though that it was worth it for her to go through all of that just so that she could write something down that allows others to avoid it, but I will say that at least she was able to capture the strategies that she used to break out of that rut, find her voice, and begin doing incredible things despite her insecurities and fears that she wasn't going to be good enough to achieve great things. So while it hurts me to know the dark place that Lisa went through, I really am excited for people who are going through something similar right now to read this book. Radical Confidence is an instruction manual for how to become the hero of your own life 
even when you're scared to death. Look, I know better than just about anybody how easy it is to get off track in life or to just not have yet found your calling. And it's even easier for people to feel so insecure and unprepared that they don't even want to pursue the things that they want. But what Lisa shows people in radical confidence is that the radical part is that you can accomplish extraordinary things even when you feel fear. That's what radical confidence is being afraid and unsure and having a toolkit that allows you to still make massive progress. Pre-order your copy today because if you act now, you can claim the bonuses that Lisa has created for you at RadicalConfidence.com. They're only available if you pre-order, so act now. Then, once you've done that, we'll get back to today's episode. All right, guys, read the book and get ready to be the hero of your own life. Peace out. The whole notion of thinking about plants, not as these inert things, which until starting to read you, I always did. I just thought of plants as is completely inert. When you talk about them as being sort of the world's most sophisticated chemical warfareist, that's where it's like, whoa. Then you begin to realize maybe what's really going on. Okay, so these lectins or particles of bacteria get into the bloodstream, immune system scans it, maybe they've ended up in the thyroid, maybe elsewhere, and it just fucking goes nuts starts attacking, you get inflammation, which has a whole host of knock-on effects from could be um, cholesterol trying to patch, could be the fat wrapping around the blood vessels or the arteries or whatever the case may be. And, you know, we're, we're now, most of us are now convinced that Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and dementia is neuroinflammation. Okay. And, what's and what people are picking up on, because they're all going to talk about the uh, beta amyloid plaques. And you've talked about how some of the co companies targeting that may actually be accelerating your yeah. onset of dementia, which is really terrifying. Really bad. Um, is that this is, again, the alien blaming the ambulance for car accidents. Yeah. So most amyloid is actually produced by bacteria in the gut. And Dale Bredesen keeps saying, he says, it's not the amyloid in the brain that we should be looking at. And no wonder $40 billion of investment in anti-amyloid drugs has been a total and useless failure, $40 billion. He says, because amyloid is produced in the gut by bacteria. And we know certain bacteria that make it and certain that don't. Mm. And why would we give the amyloid producing bacteria what they want to eat, which is simple sugars and saturated fats, the Western diet. Mm. Plus, the amyloid can't get out of the gut unless your gut is leaky. It's too big a protein to be absorbed. Mm. So Dale and I, for years, have been saying, hey guys, you're looking at the wrong spot to go after Alzheimer's. So really fast, let me ask, are you saying that beta amyloid plaques are not actually created in the brain and that they would never make their way to the brain? If you won't make them unless they get to the brain and then stimulate more production. That's so weird. Yeah. Why would the brain have the ability to produce something in the brain that would never be turned on unless it started from a problem in the gut? That seems way counterintuitive. It's basically, so we now, we now know we have, we have a leaky brain and there's okay. increased- Meaning things are crossing the blood brain barrier that, that should not. That would have never done it. And okay. there's actually a beautiful new paper that probably explains why cholesterol and amyloid and dementia actually um, coexist in people with the ApoE4 gene, um, the quote Alzheimer's gene. Um, I got interested in ApoE4, which 30% of people carry, uh, as a heart surgeon because it causes heart disease. And Dale Bredesen got interested in it because it causes dementia, mm -hmm. Alzheimer's. And lo and behold, we now know there's an intimate connection between carrying the ApoE4 gene and how cholesterol can be mischievous to you in your brain and not necessarily somebody who doesn't carry mm -hmm. that gene. What is the ApoE gene, what is it doing? Great question. So it's a, it's a carrier molecule mm -hmm. of, among other things, cholesterol. And if you carry a four mutation uh, or a double four mutation, you do statistically have an increased risk of developing Alzheimer's. You also have an increased risk of developing 
heart disease. Because it's doing because what? Because it changes the way cholesterol is transported. Interesting. It's more efficient? It's, so it's getting more ambulances it's, to the scene? It's actually worse. Let's suppose uh, the ApoE4 is a subway, mm -hmm. and it's carrying cholesterol. And it stops at a subway stop, and cholesterol gets off. And it goes into the cell, does its thing. And the cell says, okay, I've got plenty. Thanks a lot. You can take the rest of the cholesterol back and take it someplace else. So it gets back on the subway, and the subway moves on. With the ApoE4 gene, what happens is it carries the cholesterol to the cell on the subway, but when the extra cholesterol tries to get back in, the subway doors are closed. Super clear. All right? And that's the problem. You know, this is a transport problem. It's dropping the stuff off just fine, but normally it'd be picking up the stuff that, you mm -hmm. know, is needed. But it, it, so it builds up. Yeah. So it's kind of a double whammy. This is so interesting to me. It's crazy. Uh, we have a lot of ground to cover here. So one, I want to talk about fecal uh, microbial transplants, which are really interesting. So I think we have sort of a really basic understanding. Um, your book goes into a lot of detail, so people should definitely check it out because it's so interesting the more that I understand this stuff. Um, but we have a basic understanding so far in the time that we've had together today. Now, how can fecal microbial transplant help with that? Why does that work? And why didn't it get widespread adoption? So back in the 70s, when broad spectrum antibiotics came out, they, they were truly miracle drugs. Because before that, we had to uh, actually culture a bacteria, find out what antibiotic it was sensitive to, and then give that antibiotic. Mm. You know. And that would take, oh gosh, 48, 72 hours to do. When broad spectrum antibiotics were invented, it was you know it was a shotgun approach. Mm -hmm. No worry, we don't even know we don't have to know what you have uh, here. Take this, we're going to wipe out right. everything, which was great in a lot of ways. But what we didn't know was that we also wiped out every last living bacteria for the most part in our gut. Mm -hmm. And we were so naive back then that we didn't realize that that microbiome was incredibly important. And so we developed a lot of people all of a sudden with what was then called pseudomembranous enterocolitis. It's now called C. difficile, uh, Clostridium difficile. Mm. And so these guys got horrible infections in the lining of their gut. And nobody had any treatment for it. These people were dying in hospitals after getting broad-spectrum antibiotics. Mm -hmm. And we're going, what the heck? So uh, my, one of my mentors, who was the chairman of the Department of Surgery at the Medical College of Georgia in Augusta, um, said, you know, this has got to be, we've wiped out most of the bacteria in the gut. And this is an ecosystem where there are checks and balances so all of a sudden now we've wiped out most of the checks and balances and there's probably a rogue bacteria that's taken over. It's party time, you know. So clever. Party time. So he said, we got to get, you know, good stuff back. And he said, where are we going to get that? And he starts looking around at the medical students. True story. <laughs> and he said, you know, medical students, they're pretty healthy. So once a week, this is the mid-1970s, they would pass around this plastic bucket, it was called the honey pot, and we'd take it into the john and take a crap. You know, you actually had to hold it, you know, get, get to school and, you know, take a crap. And he'd take it to his lab, and I'll never forget, we had wearing blenders, you know, and homogenize all this medical Oof. student poop and put it in enema bags and give these people fecal enemas. This is wow. in the 70s. And he would have before and after pictures, and he'd go to meetings and show, you know, this horrible inflammation, this horrible infection in the colons, and then a week later, it's pristine, it's beautiful, you know, the mm. people are singing kumbaya inside the colon, and, and everybody goes, oh, he's making this stuff up, that can't happen. And so people did not believe it because we had no idea. No one had, had sequenced the human microbiome. Mm. That was really only five years ago. 
Well, now, since the sequencing of the human microbiome, it's, you know, you go, well, of course, you know, there were 10,000 different species mm -hmm. of bacteria in, in you and me. And right. In fact, a month ago, they found another thousand. And normally, there are beautiful checks and balances. But it's when these checks and balances mm -hmm. get disturbed by taking a round of antibiotics or as simply as eating meat where the chicken or the pork or the beef was given antibiotics. You know, when we eat that, they have residual antibiotics right. in them and we eat the antibiotics. Oof. Talk to me about the holome, holobiome. Holobiome. Yeah. Yeah, I, so there are a number of researchers that think we should use holobiome rather than microbiome. Microbiome mm. pretty much attempts to define the bugs that are living in our gut. Right. We have an oral microbiome, and we actually have a cloud of bacteria that live in the air around us. And there is this theory, which I really do like, that our personal space is actually determined when your holobiome, your cloud, bumps up against mine. Dude, that would be so weird well, if that's true. Well, I mean... Because you feel something like... Yeah. Yeah, you yeah. feel that. And, and there's certain people that you're, you're allowing in closer. Right. And it gets so twilight zone-y that I, you know, I always play that music in my head. We know that kissing, for instance, is a universal uh, human, great ape, and often animal characteristic. And there's some pretty cool, wacky suggestion that I really like that kissing, you are exchanging your oral microbiome yeah. and your bacteria are actually deciding if your person next to you is compatible with them. You've heard of that whole study where they have women just smell these t-shirts and rank them in order of desirability. Yeah. And the women are like, I have no idea why you're making me do this. But they put them in order of most genetic diversity or difference from their own to uh, most similar to their own. Yeah. That's surreal. Yeah. And women, you know, and I, I say this as, as often as anyone will say, Women have a gut feeling mm. far better than men. And that is because women actually are far better capable of listening to their microbiome. And I get mm. kind of deep into the fact that uh, our microbiome is inherited from our mother. We mm. get it from our mother. And all of the mitochondria, the little energy producing organelles, in us are actually engulfed bacteria that are inherited from our mother. And they have their own separate DNA and their maternal DNA. And there is now actually very good evidence that the bacteria in our microbiome communicate via text messages that now have been measured to mitochondria. They're sisters and about how things are going mm. in the, the body and the outside world. It's so crazy. So, and so talk, w women trust your gut. Yeah. And, uh, going back to the microbiome coming from your mother, yeah. um, I've become probably a little like oversteppy. Like I normally like, hey, whatever you want to do, until I hear somebody um, saying that, Oh, I, I'm, I have a planned C-section. So look, if you need one, obviously get one, Jesus. Absolutely. But if you don't need one, I'm like, make sure that you smear the baby in the vaginal fluid at a minimum. And people are always like, whoa. But just trying to pass that microbiome on, and you said there was a recent study that came out about autism and fecal microbial transplants and how the link between a, a successful, maybe the wrong word, microbiome and an unsuccessful one can manifest as autism. Talk to me about that study. Yeah, there's, um, we've known for actually a long time since the microbiome was identified and sequenced, that we know that number one, kids with autism have a lot more irritable bowel, mm -hmm. and they have a lot more GI issues, and they actually have a very different microbiome than, quote, normal. 
And there's been a suggestion for years that maybe it is that microbiome that is contributing, not when I say cause, mm. autism. There's even more exciting work in gynecology and obstetrics that the, there is a microbiome in the vagina that we know about, but there is a microbiome of the placenta itself. And there's some actually exciting work that perhaps the microbiome of the placenta is the most important in terms of mm -hmm. educating the neonate, the fetus's immune system. Do you only encounter that as um, you're actually born and you go through no, it? During like, so pregnancy. the whole time you're washing it. During, then why would a C-section be so problematic? Well, so one of the theories of autism is that this is an in utero problem that happened to the kid before he was born or she was born. The reason I say he is that boys have it far mm -hmm. more than girls. And that now there is interesting evidence that we should be working on the maternal microbiome during, before pregnancy. And certainly during pregnancy, we need to start early in making sure the microbiome is right. So getting back to autism, there was a recent study just published, and don't quote me on the exact details, but it comes out of Australia. And because of this connection with autistic kids having funny bowels and a funny microbiome, they, with an institutional review board permission, did oral fecal transplants in a large number of autistic mm. kids. And they did this for about six weeks. Almost immediately, 50% of the autism symptoms subsided. 50%. Man. And the paper has now followed these kids for two years. And the 50% reduction in symptoms has continued. Wow. And if that doesn't make the case that you know, the gut and the microbiome has such an incredible effect on the brain, I don't know what does. Mm, no kidding. <laughs> now that we know that, and your, your book goes into great detail, including recipes and all kinds of stuff, What's a quick overlay of lifestyle and dietary choices that people should make if they want to um, die young at a ripe old age, as the uh, subheadline of the book goes? So we know that there are ways to give these good guys, like at Germancia, uh, what they like to eat. And they love resistant starches. They love tubers, like yams, like jicama, like taro root, like yuca or yucca. They love uh, mushrooms. And there's a beautiful recent study out of uh, South Asia of people basically having a 90% reduction in Alzheimer's if you eat two cups of mushrooms a week. What? So there is this incredible compound in mushrooms. Uh, I'll probably fracture it. Ergotheonine, thionine, that actually crosses the blood-brain barrier, mm -hmm. better than turmeric, curcumin, right. and actually protects uh, against neuroinflammation. Mm. And it turns out that mushrooms absolutely positively feed these friendly bacteria. And mushrooms contain this compound called spermidine. Mm. It's a polyamine that study after study shows promotes longevity. Okay, so those are some of the things. Also inulin-containing compounds. Mm. So inulin is present in chicory. Uh, you can buy inulin made out of yacon root in many stores as a sweetener. So inulin feeds acromancia. And so it's present in chicory, it's present in radicchio, Belgian endive, uh, Jerusalem artichokes, sunchokes. They're just pure inulin. Mm. So the more of this stuff you eat, uh, the more of this bug you're going to grow. So that's number one. So eat for them. Number two, exercise. Beautiful study in women. Women have more Alzheimer's disease than men. And so you look at an exercise program in women. Women who exercise regularly, routinely, kind of from midlife on, have a 90% reduction 
in Alzheimer's. Whoa. And compared to women who don't exercise routine. Mm. And in the women who are going to get Alzheimer's, it's 11 years later than if they didn't exercise. So, I mean, think about that. If we had a drug that had a 90% reduction in Alzheimer's, yeah. you know, how much would we pay for that? You know, nuts. you and I would be <laughs> popping that nuts. every day. Uh, we wouldn't have $40 billion wasted on amyloid drugs. Mm. But it's available by housework, by gardening, by getting a dog and walking it twice okay, a day. Okay, that's interesting. So when you say housework, why do you say that? I think people would be confused by that. It turns out that, uh, give me an example, my, my mother actually scrubbed her floors until the day she died at 90, uh, even though there were Swifters and things mm. like that. And she did it as an exercise program exercise changes the gut microbiome yeah, that's to a friendly microbiome. Meditation, yoga changes the gut microbiome. It seems impossible. It's so interesting that they're in a two-way communication. Yeah, yeah, it literally, and there's, there's even some really cool stuff that yoga postures uh, actually move this microbiome mm. around in your gut and they actually get signals, probably electrical signals. So all these chakras that, you know, in Eastern medicine, it's probably all this part of this really amazing communication system that Western medicine is just going, oh, come on, that's all voodoo. Yeah. Because Seems we couldn't impossible. measure it before. Mm. Yeah. So exercise is really important. Lastly, uh, I really want people to have a brainwash day mm. at least once a week. So uh, in the last couple of years, we've learned that there is a uh, lymph system in the brain called the glymphatic system. And it, no one actually believed it existed, but now it, it exists. And the brain actually in deep sleep, which happens very early in the sleep cycle, goes through a literal wash cycle. Mm. It shrinks by about 20%. And all of these toxins, like amyloid, like tau, like bad pieces of protein, are actually squeezed out of the brain, like wringing out mm. a sponge. And it happens in deep sleep, and it happens early in the sleep cycle. So we have to have a lot of blood flow to our brain to do that. The brain uses huge amounts of blood flow, but we have to have even more. So the evidence is that you need about a three or four hour window before the last meal of your day, mm. before you go to sleep. Why? Because digestion is actually really energy expensive. Mm. So we put huge amounts of blood flow down into our gut. If you eat near the time you go to bed, that blood flow is down in your intestines and it doesn't go up to your mm. brain. So there's actually a recent study of men who had uh, unstable angina or heart attack and they followed those men who ate late at night had a much higher incidence of a new wow. angina or new heart, heart attack hmm. and so they're all really actually interconnected so one day a week i ask people finish your last meal at six o'clock hmm. if you go to bed at say 10. right if it's 11 finish it at seven do not snack before bedtime and allow yourself to have a brainwash. Better yet, skip a meal. And that gets in probably to the fourth point. You've got to have periods of extended lengths of time between eating. We were supposed to go prolonged periods of time before our next meal. Mm. And break fast, we've talked about this before, it ruins your, you know, your morning stuff. Uh, was you break your fast and, it, and there's no definition of when you know it's supposed to be breakfast right. that was from the dear old kellogg's cornflake company telling people they had to eat breakfast well, i remember my freshman year of high school after I, I got arrested cleaned my life up my dad kicked me out you're not kicked me out but keep, had me go to rehab outpatient rehab the best decision ever changed my life got into fitness and all that but i really struggled in school and i really believed that i was dumb 